Well, hello again. Welcome to another episode of the Eat Your Greens with Dr. Black podcast. I have a really fun episode today for you. This is a little bit different. Today's episode comes from a live presentation that I gave to our local lifelong learning group. I was asked to talk about how a plant-based diet can help you not only prevent, but also manage or even reverse some of the most common chronic diseases facing Americans today. I cover heart disease, diabetes, and cancer. The presentation is drawn from information in two books that I cannot recommend enough. That's Undo It by Dr. Dean Ornish and How Not to Die by Dr. Michael Greger. Both of these books are strongly evidence-based and lay out actionable tips for how you can actually be healthier and live a longer life. So if you can, head to your local library or go online, go to your bookshop and pick up copies of those books, you will not regret it. Definitely money well spent. This episode does work as an audio only podcast, so you can feel free to enjoy it on your favorite podcast app as you normally do. But if you would prefer to see it with the slides that I use to give the presentation, head on over to the Eat Your Greens with Dr. Black YouTube channel. You will find both versions there, both the audio only version and a video version that includes the slides. I hope you enjoyed today's talk. I hope you come away with some easy, actionable, powerful tools that you can use to take control of your health. So without further ado, I'm going to just flip it on over to my presentation, and I'll see you on the other side. So yes, I'm a general pediatrician, and I am have been in practice now for going on 25 years, which means I'm on my second generation of patients, right? I call them my grand patients. I don't have any grand kids yet, but I have grand patients, and they're great. I love them, and I learn something from my patients, as you do every day. My favorite thing that I ever learned, so a four or five-year-old comes in for his checkup, and I'm talking about nutrition and healthy food, and I ask him, what's your favorite vegetable? His answer was Oreos. It's like, (laughs) this is the best news I've ever had. I didn't actually know Oreos were a vegetable, but now that I know, they are also my favorite vegetable. So there you go. Uh, They're great. And they're gluten-free and vegan. Well, no, they're not always. They do make a gluten-free Oreo, but they're usually not. But they are vegan, so he wasn't too far off. Anyways, they're great. Um, Now, In pediatrics, we mostly do prevention, right? And occasionally we have uh, some patients who develop some of these chronic diseases, but mostly it's about prevention. But my day, my talk today is going to include what to do if you already have some of these common chronic diseases. And by common, you know, if we just think about the people in the room here, if we look at the statistics, uh, probably one in 10 of us already has diabetes. Now, more important though, of every two and a half people in this room, one of us has prediabetes, and many of us don't even know it. So the rates of global rates of diabetes are expected to double in the next 25 years. It's becoming a major health issue. About half of the people in the room have high blood pressure, and one in five of us is at risk of dying from a heart attack. That's the leading cause of death, right? So um, of the top 10 leading causes of death, on the CDC's website, seven of the 10 are potentially modifiable by lifestyle choices. I mean, if you think about smoking, we know we can change our risks, right? We have, we have some control over some of these. So those um, potentially modifiable uh, disorders that include the top two leading causes of death, that's heart disease and cancer. Also number five, stroke. Number eight, diabetes. And what many people may not know, number seven, Alzheimer's. We may be able to modify our risk of developing Alzheimer's and also even slow the progression if we already have been diagnosed. And we're going to talk, I'm going to talk more about that uh, during the talk. So today's talk, my, my goal here today is to have you leave this room with some actionable things that you can do to change your health, not only prevent these diseases, but also manage or even potentially reverse them if you already have them. So that's the goal for today. I do want to start with a patient story. 
So I had this guy, I was seeing him, you know, most of his life and he's getting older. And as he gets older, he's gaining weight, gaining weight. And I'm doing the usual in office, you know, eat more vegetables, eat less junk food, turn off the tablet, go outside and play, you know, all the things. But by age 14, he is significantly overweight. He comes in to see me feeling a little sick. And I do my evaluation, check him out, check his blood sugar. It's over 400. He had type 2 diabetes, admitted him to the hospital, consulted endocrinology, and they kind of took it from there. They started him on the diabetes medications and kind of took over his care. I didn't see him again for a couple of years. And so he came in for a checkup. He's like 16 now, right? Comes in to see me. And I walk in the room and I almost didn't recognize him. He had lost an incredible amount of weight. He was fit, like he'd been working out at the gym. He's got some muscles. He looked great. More importantly, he was off all of his diabetes medications. He had taken control, gotten off the meds. He'd taken, you know, like essentially did not have type 2 diabetes anymore. And I was just floored. And I almost started crying. It's like, you don't understand how rare this is. Like, we never see this. Uh, we have, you know, we give all this advice. We see the patients. They never lose weight. And this was just amazing. So I'm just like, you know, oh, tearing up. And this kid's looking at me like, okay, my doctor is legit tweaking, no cap. <laughs> so in case you don't also speak Gen Z, I can translate that for you, right? My doctor is losing her mind. But, you know, looking at the audience, I think I know what a few of you are thinking. I can tell. At least a few of you are thinking. Dr. Black, you need a vibe check. Mm -hmm. That Teen Sigma can have a glow up, but you are Delulu if you think anybody over the age of 60 is going to eat their favorite foods. That's so Ohio, period. <laughs> All right, what the heck does that mean, right? Dr. Black, please get in touch with reality, right? Maybe some teenager can get healthier, but what are the chances that anybody over the age of 60 is going to really change their habits? Uh, I think you're a little crazy basically. To which I might reply, bruh, that's valid. <laughs> but I'm about to spill the tea on some skibbity research that will leave you shook. So, you know, just let me cook. <laughs> All right. So look, yeah, okay, you have some valid points. Change is hard, but there's some really good research out there that I'm going to share today with you that might change your perspective. And so please let me proceed. <laughs> All right, so that's fun. Like I said, I love my patients. Now, his story, though, got me thinking, like, if he can do it, what about the rest of us? What about my other patients? Why can't we all do that? Um, and more specifically, more important, what can I do differently to help my patients achieve a similar outcome? And not too long after that, I stumbled across something called lifestyle medicine. I had never heard of it before. And I was a little, you know, skeptical at first. I'm definitely an evidence-based practitioner. And I thought, you know, is this like alternative medicine? Is it woo? Are we going to be aligning chakras? Like, what are we doing here? But I was curious. So I started looking into it and discovered that it is actually a relatively new but legitimate evidence-based medical specialty. It is recognized by the American Medical Association. And so I decided, wow, this is pretty cool. This is, aligns exactly with what I want to do. So I'm going to pursue a second board certification in lifestyle medicine. I'll be taking the exam at the end of the year. And if I pass, I will be dual board certified. As a part of that um, process, I went to the ACLM, the American College of Lifestyle Medicine's conference last year. And I was able to hear a number of really amazing speakers. There's some really incredible work going on in this space. Uh, two of them in particular stood out. And my talk today is based largely on their work and some of the books that they've written, which I have over here. So um, the first one, uh, well, let me go back to lifestyle medicine. Uh, it's based on these six pillars of uh, healthy lifestyle habits. They all have evidence to support them. They're all equally important. Of course, my focus is on nutrition, right? So uh, that's what I'm going to talk about today, how a whole food plant-based diet can help you with your health goals. Um, Dr. Dean Ornish, 
Now, many of you may have heard of him. He's pretty well known. He's actually a Texas native. He did his undergraduate at UT. He went to medical school at the Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, and then he went to Harvard to train in internal medicine. He was appointed as an advisor both under Bill Clinton and Obama, and um, he has written this book, Undo It, How Simple Lifestyle Changes Can Reverse Most Chronic Disease. Um, he is an amazing person, and uh, I hope you can look into more of his work. The other um, leader in the lifestyle space is Dr. Michael Greger. He did his medical training at Tufts University and has really focused most of his career on uh, the science behind nutrition, and he has a nonprofit organization called nutritionfacts.org, and he's also written a few books. Now, his books are not how-to books. They are how-not-to books, right? How Not to Die. That's what we're going to talk about today. His other book is How Not to Age, so that's the science behind longevity, right? So really some amazing um, role models here for me to live up to in the lifestyle medicine space. One further point before I get into the actual data. The idea is not to suck all of the joy out of your life, right? When people think about making healthy changes, a lot of times they think about what they can't have. Like, you mean to tell me I can't eat my favorite, you know, fill in the blank or whatever. So I really want you to flip your mindset. Like when we talk about making healthy changes, it's important to have a positive mindset. What are you going to gain? What are you going to add? Well, first of all, plant-based food is incredible. There is some amazingly delicious food out there that, you know, you can add to your diet. So they're right there, you're gaining a lot. But you can gain uh, energy, gain your health, gain longevity, um, be able to be active, play with your kids, travel, right? Your quality of life will increase and also happiness because a lot of the things I'm going to talk about today have also been shown to improve depression and anxiety, right? So what are you going to gain from making some healthy choices? Let's focus on that. All right, so Dr. Ornish's work. He was the primary investigator in a trial, the Lifestyle Heart Trial. This was a five-year randomized control study that looked at how a comprehensive lifestyle intervention program would help people with advanced coronary artery disease, right, heart disease. And they compared that to what was at the time the American Heart Association's conventional treatment. So it wasn't no treatment. It was standard of care versus lifestyle modification under his program. And um, so his program involves a low-fat vegetarian diet, regular daily moderate exercise, smoking cessation, and group psychosocial support. Those are the elements of his program. And he was able to show that by the end of the first year, the patients in his group had a 37% reduction in their LDL cholesterol levels and a 91% uh, reduction in the angina. That's that heart-related chest pain that people get at the end of one year versus the American Heart Association group who only had a 6% reduction in their cholesterol, but a 165% increase in that chest pain. At the end of the five-year study, they uh, took a look at the coronary arteries in the participants and in the treatment group, they were able to measure significant regression of those cholesterol plaques in the arteries versus the conventional treatment group who had progression, they had worsening of their coronary artery disease, and twice as many cardiac events, that's doctor speak for heart attacks, by the end of the five-year study. So this was pretty amazing data. In fact, it was the first time that we were able to show that healthy lifestyle changes can lead to regression of even severe coronary artery disease, right? And this was off medication. So neither group was taking lipid-lowering medication uh, in this study. Uh, I, so in, in his book, in the first chapter, he shares a story of one of an individual who went through his program. He was a doctor, a surgeon, and he had two severe heart attacks back-to-back -back and had significant damage to his heart, such that he was on the waiting list for a heart transplant. So while he was waiting for his um, heart donor heart to become available, 
he decided, you know, what have I got to lose? I'm going to do Dr. Ornish's program. It's a nine-week program. By the end of the nine weeks, his heart function had improved so much that he was actually no longer eligible for the heart transplant. So there you go, the power of this uh, intensive lifestyle change. Now, it is, I would like to say the original study only had 48 participants. That's not a lot of people in a study. Like We like to see a lot of people to really trust the data. He has since gone on to um, demonstrate that his program works in over 4,000 people. The evidence is so strong that it is the first time that CMS, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, right, has approved a treatment outside of the conventional American Heart Association. So you can now do regular uh, cardiac rehab if you have a heart attack, or you can do intensive cardiac rehab. That's Dr. Ornish's program, um, and it's covered by Medicare. So that's pretty impressive. Doctor, um, if you, so with his book, if you have not had an actual heart attack, you don't need intensive cardiac rehab, maybe you'd like to not get there in the first place, right? Uh, in his book, he outlines his um, lifestyle program, Ornish lifestyle program, and it has these four components, right? He advocates for eating well, moving more, stressing less, and loving more. Those are his, the four pillars of his program. So amazing. I mean, who doesn't want to do any of those things, right? So the idea that eating a healthy diet, exercising, and meditating is you know, a radical change. People push back against it versus actually having open heart surgery. I don't know. <laughs> like, I know which one I would rather do. So moving on to Dr. Greger's work. So to say that Dr. Greger is a evidence-based practitioner is an understatement. So his book, How Not to Die, is about 400 pages long, and it includes 500 citations back to the scientific literature, right? His other book, How Not to Age, is actually 600 pages long and has over 1,300 citations. So well grounded in the evidence. He looks at all of it so that you don't have to. And um, his work is pretty amazing. How Not to Die is organized. His chapters are organized by disease, by condition. So it includes things like How Not to Die from Heart Disease, Diabetes, a Variety of Cancers, suicidal depression, infection, and iatrogenic causes. And if you don't know what iatrogenic means, that means how not to die from doing what your doctor tells you to do. <laughs> yeah, that too. Maybe we don't always get it right. Okay, Dr. Greger. Let's start with heart disease. Um, heart disease is the leading cause of death across the board, and it has been for quite a while. It is directly related to your cholesterol level, right? So, so much so that if you have a low enough cholesterol level, you will not get heart disease regardless of any other risk factor that you might have. I do want to differentiate cardiovascular disease from heart disease. Heart disease is specifically those vessels that supply our heart muscle, the coronary arteries. Cardiovascular disease encompasses the whole body, right? So if you have narrowing of the blood vessels, say to your legs, that's peripheral vascular disease, to your brain, you can have a stroke or dementia, or other parts of your body, you know, like erectile dysfunction, also cardiovascular disease. So what can we do to prevent that? Well, first of all, we want to avoid things that raise our cholesterol. That's going to be saturated fat, trans fat. Now, saturated fat is mostly found in animal products. Also, coconut oil, palm oil, things like that, those tropical oils, it's solid at room temperature. Trans fat is something that's mostly artificially created, has largely been taken out of our food supply, but not completely. Also, salt, having diabetes, and just chronic inflammation. All of these things raise your cholesterol level. Well, what can we do to bring it back down? What about a plant-based diet? There's a lot of evidence. Two particular pivotal studies looked at the effect of a plant-based diet to bring down cholesterol. One of them was called the Garden of Eden study, and it took a plant-based diet and compared it to lipid-lowering medications, right, those statins that most of us are on, and it showed that the plant-based group had a 30% reduction in their cholesterol level 
and that was equal to the effect of the medication group. So there was no difference between the two groups. Now, this was not a long-term study. This was a two-week study. 30% drop in cholesterol levels in two weeks equal to the effect of medication without the side effects that go with the medication. The other one was something looking at what's called a portfolio diet. And a portfolio diet has been um, widely studied. It includes uh, what we see here, uh, lots of plant protein, soluble fiber, monounsaturated fats. So that's going to be like what you get in avocados, olive oil, things like that, and something called plant sterols. Plant sterols are found in a lot of fruits and vegetables, a lot in beans, and they, um, they're they sort of like the plant version of cholesterol. So cholesterol is only in animal products. So these plant sterols compete with the, for absorption. So if you're eating foods with lots of plant sterols, you're not going to absorb that cholesterol, and that's how they help you drop your cholesterol levels, right? So the portfolio diet study looked at 123,000 postmenopausal women. Postmenopausal women are at high risk of heart disease because estrogen is protective. And when you lose that, you're going to be at higher risk, right? So this was over a 25-year span. And they found that the women who adheres, adhered to the portfolio-style diet had a significant drop in their cholesterol in a dose-dependent manner, right? The more you stuck to these foods, the better the result, ranging from 17 to 35%. Uh, the portfolio diet also, um, so not only did their cholesterol go down, but then you could see the downstream effects, right? Overall cardiovascular disease, coronary artery disease, and also just heart failure, those rates were reduced over that 25-year period in the women. They've studied this portfolio diet uh, extensively since then in a number of different studies. They even compared it to two different well-known healthy diets, the DASH diet, which is Dietary Approaches to Stop Heart Hypertension, and Mediterranean diet. A lot of us have heard about the Mediterranean diet, and both of these are largely plant-based diets, and the portfolio diet beat them out. So really good evidence. Now, a little poll, if you had to guess, like the single most important food that you can eat to improve your health. Any ideas? What, what is it? What is the number one food that you can eat? I see some Oreos. hands. Oreos, yes. <laughs> maybe, maybe. We'll see. Ice cream, yeah. Okay. Wrong answers only. Is that what we're doing? <laughs> beans. Beans or nuts. Yeah. Beets. Salad. Yeah. A lot of great answers here. CVD, cardiovascular disease, yeah. and coronary artery disease. So in terms of dropping your cholesterol, it's anything rich in soluble fiber, right? So we're going to have our seeds like chia, flax, hemp, sunflower, pumpkin seeds, all of those things, nuts, and beans. I heard beans. Uh, the people that said beans know me, so <laughs> they know. <laughs> all right, let's move on to type 2 diabetes. Now, Raise your hand. Who has heard that a low-carb diet is the best diet to follow if you have diabetes? Has anybody heard that? Right? So it's common, like you see it all over the place. It's, it's not true. And this is because the, the low-carb diet, especially that we follow here, is going to be high in animal protein and high in saturated fat, right? So not a healthy diet. Uh, it turns out that, um, well, let me just start. What is type 2 diabetes? Just in case you don't know. You know, diabetes is where your blood sugar is going too high. Type 1, your pancreas kind of calls it quits and you're not making the hormone insulin. That's a different disorder. I'm not talking about that. Type 2 is where you're making plenty of insulin, but your body just can't use it to do its job, right? And this is the one that is highly modifiable by lifestyle. Um, it is very strongly, a very strongly correlated with obesity. And it's not that obesity causes type 2 diabetes directly, but the same things that cause obesity also set us up for type 2 diabetes and insulin resistance. So um, when you eat, right, you eat food, you digest it, your blood sugar goes up, your body secretes the hormone insulin, Insulin's job is to take that sugar, glucose, out of your blood and put it into the cells where it can be used for energy. If you eat more calories than you burn, you're going to gain weight. So there's the obesity part. 
but it also sets us up for something called energy toxicity. This is a relatively new term to describe this phenomenon, right? Your cells are working to make, to use that sugar to make energy, but they can only do so much. Those little mitochondria, right? Those little energy making factories that you learned about in middle school, like they can only do so much. They can only handle so much. At some point they're overwhelmed and they're like, you know, close the gate. We can't let any more sugar in. So they block the effect of insulin insulin resistance, your blood sugar goes up, you have type 2 diabetes. Now, we know that fat has more calories than carbs and protein. If you didn't know that, now you do. So when we eat a diet high in fat, that also gets taken up into our cells, and then it kind of gums up the work. So if you have fat deposition into your muscle cells, those are very metabolically active. They burn a lot of our um, glucose for energy, right? And our liver gums it up, the insulin can't do its job. So those are two of several, but two main mechanisms by which we develop insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes. So what can we do about it? Well, there are a lot of studies out there looking at a plant-based diet and its effects on not only preventing, but also managing and even reversing type 2 diabetes. I mean, think about my patient, right? He lost weight and came off all of his medications. So even reversal is possible. Uh, just a couple of them. Uh, one diet looking at a plant-based diet showed that you can reduce, the patients reduced their need for insulin, their insulin dose by 60% in four months. Uh, another one, even if you're over 60, it's not too late. A plant-based diet can reduce your risk of developing type 2 diabetes by as much as 71%. Uh, a well-known study, the Harvard Nurses Study, a lot of people have heard of that. Maybe some people have even participated in it. I know my mom was a part of it. Um, followed a, it's a you know huge study and showed that even a 5% swap, so uh, you take 5% of what you're eating from animal protein and swap it with a plant protein, you can reduce your risk of diabetes by as much as 25%. And then one other one pitted a vegan diet, so that's absolutely no animal products at all, with the American Dietetic Association's recommended diet. So these were patients who already had diabetes, and some of them were following the guidelines from the American Dietetic Association, and then others were following vegan. And they found that the vegan group dropped their insulin requirement by 43% compared to 26% in the ADA group, right? So very powerful. The more you know, towards plant-based you go, the more effect you're going to see. A lot of this is related to the effect of fiber. So fiber is only in plants. You cannot get it from animal sources. And it's very important for your health. In particular, it supports a healthy gut microbiome. And I'm not going to talk about the microbiome today because once I get started talking about that, we will be here all day. It's incredible. It's I talk about science nerd. I totally nerd out about that. But support eating foods that support a healthy gut microbiome has also been shown to help regulate blood sugar control. All right. So what foods do we think we can eat the most of to help us if either prevent or manage our diabetes? What do we think it's going to be? Oh, look, things with fiber, whole grains, fruits and vegetables, and, oh, there's beans again. Saw them again. I, I Also, I'd like to point out, none of those are low-carb foods, right? This is kind of the definition of a high-carb diet. They're just not processed carbs. It's not refined processed, you know, sugar. We're talking about nice, healthy, whole, uh, high-carb foods here. So that's important. All right, the next one I want to touch on is cancer. Now, cancer is very complex. The causes are complex. There's, you know, it's multifactorial. Lots of things go into raising your cancer risk. But we know that at least some of them are modifiable. Think about smoking. Don't smoke, probably not going to get lung cancer. Also, a number of other cancers you're, uh, are much lower if you're not a smoker. Um, so when we talk about cancer, we're going to talk about what's the number one thing you should not eat to lower your cancer risk, and that's going to be processed food. That's things like hot dogs, sausage, deli meat. I'm very sorry to tell you, bacon. So I know that's bad news for a lot of people, right? According to the World Health Organization, processed meats are classified as a group one carcinogen. That means that the science is strong enough to say that they definitely cause cancer. Tobacco is also a group one carcinogen. 
But what about unprocessed meats? I mean, what about that really expensive cut of grass-fed beef? That's healthy, right? It's got to be healthier. Well, unprocessed meats are group 2A carcinogens, meaning the science suggests that they probably also cause cancer. So uh, the stats say if you have a lot of unprocessed meat in your diet, you may have a 30% increased risk of cancer. If it's, un if it's processed, then that goes up to 40% increased risk of any type of cancer, right? We can touch on a couple of the specific types. So prostate cancer, very common. Um, Dr. Ornish did a study where he looked at his lifestyle program on prostate cancer. Now, the treatment for prostate cancer is very invasive, right? It's surgical, radiation, and it can have a lot of complications and side effects. So some men with early, low-grade prostate cancer opt not to treat it. They, no treatment at all. So Dr. Ornish recruited a group of these men and who were not going to do anything and, and randomized them to no treatment versus his program. And he was able to show that the lifestyle modifications he recommends dropped their PSA level. That's the thing we measure to see how, you know, much, how much prostate tumor you have. So the prostate, the PSA level dropped and the tumor size actually got smaller. So regression of the cancer versus the no treatment group, as you would expect, their PSA levels went up and their tumors advanced. And a number of them dropped out of the study and opted to go ahead with the conventional treatment because their cancer was progressing. So regression of prostate cancer with a uh, of early non-aggressive prostate cancer. Um, for the women, breast cancer, you know, always a big concern. It's not really so much whether or not you eat meat for breast cancer. It's how you cook it. So high temperature cooking generates a lot of toxic compounds. So they did some studies. Women who ate a large percentage of grilled or barbecued meat had significantly higher, 47% higher risk of developing breast cancer. Now, when they looked at that group of women, if they also did not eat many vegetables, their risk went up to 74%. They also did a study where they looked at women and how they preferred, whether they preferred their meat rare or midwell versus well done. And in that group, the women who preferred well done had five times the breast cancer risk. So... Uh, of course, that's called the meat paradox because, you know, if you overcook your meat, you raise your cancer risks. If you undercook it, you know, you could get sick from other things. So maybe just you know, <laughs> avoid it altogether. I don't know. Um, what about soy? A lot of people have heard that soy can raise your breast cancer risk because we know that estrogen can put us at risk for breast cancer. And soy has something called phytoestrogen. So it's an estrogen-like molecule. But when they studied it, the opposite was actually found. Breast cancer risk is lower in women who consume more soy products. What if you already have cancer, though? You know, you want to be extra careful if you already have breast cancer. They found that the women who consumed the most soy uh, had higher survival rates and a lower recurrence rate after treatment. Even one cup of soy milk a day can reduce your breast cancer risk by as much as 25%. Other foods, greens, greens are healthy, right? They did another study that showed that even just two servings a day of green leafies can reduce significantly reduce breast cancer risk. I mean, seems like a no-brainer to me, right? Uh, collard greens and broccoli were the highest, uh, most protective. May? We have a question about soy. Um, soy milk, for example, is the rage. It was in the stores and... Now you can't find it. You have to look on the cloud. Well, that's just marketing, right? That's the dairy industry, just marketing. Okay, so is the word out, I mean, I'm not aware of uh -huh. Is the word out among the general public that's so many milking fat? Yes, yes. And it's all, it's like social media, you know, there's this term soy boy. You know, if you let your little boys drink a lot of soy milk, they're going to get man boobs and be all girly, you know. Uh, and it's just not true, right? It's absolutely not true. So there is a lot of misinformation about soy out there, but it's absolutely healthy. It's a healthy source of plant-based protein. Uh, often, especially things like tofu, they have calcium. Um, they have these phytoestrogens, you know, all these phytochemicals, isoflavones, things that support the gut microbiome. 
uh, yeah, so it's actually a very healthy food. Um, so if we uh, talk about what are the best foods to eat to lower your cancer risk, soy is probably on the list. What do you think? What else might be on the list? Broccoli. What about beans? Not beans again. I'm starting to think they might actually be healthy or something. I don't know. So, uh, yeah, and for every 20 grams of fiber in your diet that you um, add, you can decrease your overall cancer risk by as much as 14%. So there you go. All right, so... <laughs> uh, see me later for, for some good recipes. I can help you out there. <laughs> Absolutely not. So what about, you know... Just dying. How can we, you know, pre prevent that? Just dying prematurely. This is all-cause mortality, right? All the things out there that can kill us. And what they have found is that even small changes can make a big difference. So a couple of really large long-term cohort studies showed that even reducing your animal protein intake by 3% and swapping it with a plant-based protein can significantly reduce your risk of dying by as much as 10%. And you can double that if you cut out eggs. Other studies have linked a high protein diet. So people who just eat the most protein have the highest rates of death, of early death, right? So but the opposite is true if it's a plant-based protein. You eat more plant-based protein, your risk of dying drops. So even at the high protein levels, you can improve your, your risk. Are there any studies that um, look at protein powders? Protein powders are, yeah, I'm, right, pros and cons of protein powders. I haven't seen them. I'm sure there are some. The thing about protein powders is they are a processed food, right? So I think they have their place. It's not so much the powder as what's added. A lot of them have sugar or other sweeteners. They have emulsifiers, things like that added into them. Uh, when I make a smoothie, I do use a 100% pea protein powder to boost the protein in my smoothie. But I specifically chose one that had nothing added to it. So I think they have their place, but I really advocate for a whole food, plant-based diet whenever possible, right? So whole means Processing is anything we do to change the food from its natural state. There's no French fry tree out there, chicken nugget tree. Uh, you know, try to eat foods that look like they looked in nature is basically what that means. Good question. Thank you. All right. So um, fiber, got to talk about my favorite F word again, fiber. And other studies have shown that uh, if you at least meet the minimal daily requirement of protein, you can also reduce your cancer risk. Now, that is, depending on your gender, uh, around the area of like 28, 30 grams per day is the minimum recommended amount of fiber that we should be getting in our diet. And we do a terrible job of that. Most Americans only get half of the minimum amount of fiber. So, mm-hmm. That. Studies actually do not support a benefit. It might help you go to the bathroom, but that's about it. So again, getting that fiber from actual plant, you know, whole plant-based sources. And again, it has to do with what comes along with it. Also, diversity is important. So see, so you're going to get me talking about the gut microbiome. <laughs> um, there's, you know, hundreds, there's thousands of types of bacteria that live in our gut, and they all like their own type of fiber. Well, there's tens of thousands of types of plants and they all have their own fiber profile. So the diversity is really important, right? Um, and again, you know, processed artificial, you know, versus whole plant states. Um, I included a few stats here from Dr. Greger's How Not to Age book. So these have to do with longevity. But each additional serving of fill in the blank drops your chance of early mortality by. So for vegetables, 4%, fruit, 6 whole grains, 8 Legumes, that's beans and things like that, 10. And nuts, 15%, even for a half a serving. Now, a full serving is an ounce. That's like a little handful. So even a half a handful of nuts every day can uh, boost your health and reduce your risk of all-cause mortality. Peanuts do count. They're technically a legume, but they count. Walnuts, things like that. Cashews. Yeah, all the nuts. Yeah, all of them, almonds. Pumpkins are a seed. Pumpkin seeds are a seed, but they are in that list of Foods that are, you know, we've seen seeds come up a few times on our slides. Well, yeah, lowering your salt is important, especially for your heart disease. So, um, 
best roasted, I think is okay, especially like cashews, I think can be toxic if eaten raw. So should be uh, at least soaked in hot water a little bit. But across the board, just eating nuts is going to increase your chances of survival. All right, so what do we think, based on what I've presented, I'm going to ask it again, what's the number one most important food we got to eat to improve our health? What do you think? Beans, beans. No, it's not actually a food. It's fiber. It's a food component, right? So, but good guess. Beans are on the list and greens, all the whole grains and berries. Berries are actually a great source of fiber and they're high in an antioxidants. I didn't even talk about antioxidants. Those reduce that chronic inflammation that was associated with all the things. So berries are an excellent source. So you talk beans and, you buy, you know, mm -hmm. that, that's good. That's you fine. Yeah, watch the salt content. Um, you know, if you don't have time to soak your beans and cook them and all that kind of thing, then just go with the canned or the frozen. Absolutely. However you can get them in, it's fine. You know, another question that's related that comes up is organic versus conventional. And I think there is data to support that organic is healthier. But here's the thing. If you can't afford it and it means like organic or none, go with the conventional. It's more important to eat these healthy fruits and vegetables and plant-based foods. All right, so more plants, more health, right? I think that's pretty clear. The science is uh, pretty, pretty clear on that. And that's because all of these diseases I talked about share some similar root causes. Now, we think of them as separate disorders. You know, you get your heart disease, you go see your cardiologist, they're going to prescribe their meds. You have cancer, you go to the oncologist. You have diabetes, you go to the endocrinologist. They all have their thing. We think of them as separate but they're really all interconnected. They have similar causes. The number one cause behind all of these is our high animal protein, high fat, low fiber, standard American diet, unfortunately. It's the truth. And this is what I try to, you know, how hard is it to convince the five-year-olds, you know? <laughs> like, we might have a better grasp of that, but boy, get a kid to believe that. It's hard. Yes, ma'am. Well, what are we going to get out? That's a very common question, right? Because people think of meat as being a great source of iron, and it is. There are two types of iron. There's heme iron. That's what you, comes in blood, so you're going to get it from animals. It's very well absorbed. It's also very pro-inflammatory. And in some cases, if you're eating a really high meat diet, you can actually get too much, and it can be toxic. So good plant-based sources, this is non-heme iron, are all the green leafies, beans, imagine that, it is less well absorbed though. So if you have severe anemia, your doctor might recommend that you include some healthy lean sources of meat to get your iron up. But you can boost the absorption from plant-based sources by adding a vitamin C, right? So if you're having a spinach salad, add some raspberries or something like that, strawberries, right? Have a fruit salad on the, if you, you know, spaghetti is a great source, you can have a nice green leafy salad, you know, eat some beans, have the tomato sauce, you know, add some vitamin C and it boosts the iron absorption from the plant-based sources. But it's a very common question. Yeah, protein is the other one. But doctor, what about protein? Well, we know from the previous slide, a high protein diet actually increases your risks of dying. So first of all, we're getting way too much protein uh, for the most part in this country. Secondly, beans, tofu, soy, things like that. There are, you can get all the protein you need from a purely plant-based diet. Yes, ma'am. Well, cheese are a good source of protein and calcium, you know, dairy, but they are also high in saturated fat. So that's going to raise a lot of those risks. And cheese is actually the number one source of saturated fat in the American diet, largely from pizza. So we eat a lot of pizza in this country. Uh, you don't have a prostate, I assume, so you're not worried about your prostate cancer risk, but it also raises your pro you know, men's prostate cancer risk. So by and large, um, you know, cut back. Absolutely. Okay, so fish. Fish is also another one that, you know, can go uh, either way. So there is definitely data to say that fish is healthy uh, because it has, it can be rich in those omega-3 fatty acids. That's an essential fatty acid that our body can't make. We do need that. And fish can be a good source. Um, the issues around fish stem more from the high levels of pollution in the ocean and the microplastics, the effect of overfishing on the environment, you know, so that one's 
a little like, yeah, okay, a little bit in your diet can be healthy, but uh, by and large, it's not sustainable and you're getting a lot of those toxins too. So you got to be careful with that one. If you want to increase your omega-3 intake, seeds like flax, chia, and, and uh, hemp seeds and walnuts are particularly high. So you can still get it from your diet. Um, and then uh, nobody asked it yet, but vitamin B12, you know, People who are vegans need a vitamin B12 supplement. Um, it's largely from animals. It's not that the like cows make their own B12. We, you know, it's actually made by soil bacteria. And the cows, it's either added to their feed or they get it if they're actually free range and eating the grass and they're getting the soil. So we get it from them. Um, vegans who don't eat any kind of animal source need a supplement. But honestly, our ability to absorb it wanes with time. So anybody over the age of 50 really ought to be on a B12 supplement. And there are some good ones on the market. Okay, moving on here. So if you're interested in adopting a plant-based diet, Dr. Greger has an app. It's free. You can download it to your device. And, um, you know, his top recommendations based on his review of the science. Now, I, I like this um, app. I have it. But I found it a little complicated, a little cumbersome. It's a lot if you look at it. So for my patients, I developed a lower tech and more simplified version, right? So it's a dry, I have a, a bunch here. They're dry erase magnets. You can put them on your fridge. And every day you mark off that you got each one. At the end of the week, you erase it, start over, right? So uh, please feel free to take one home with you today. Now, the other question nobody's asked is, what about genetics? Like, Dr. Black, everyone in my family has diabetes or heart disease or whatever. You know, like, forget it. Why should I bother? I'm doomed because of genetics. Well, there's something called the 80-20 rule. When scientists looked at it, they found that only 20% of your risk actually comes from your genes. The other 80% is your lifestyle. So this is something that you definitely have the power to change, right? Um, so lifestyle or genetics, genes loads the gun and lifestyle pulls the trigger. And one more, one more second. Um, the other way you can look at the 80-20 rule is your approach to eating, right? If you're not ready to go full vegan, you want to still enjoy some of that cheese, a little bit of fish, whatever, do an 80-20 rule for your diet. 80% plant-based and 20% animal. You'll still reap a lot of those benefits. So yes, ma'am, thank you for waiting. I'm just curious. Can you explain as far as genetics? Mm -hmm. So, when, you know, when they did large population-based studies to look at rates of these things, they found that even in, say, populations um, that were genetically predisposed to these chronic diseases, if they adhered to a healthy lifestyle, um, ate a plant-based diet, those, um, that genetic risk largely went away. So only about 20% of your risk is thought to be attributed to your genetics and the rest to, you know, how you live your life and what you do, where you live. I mean, things like pollution, th there are things that we can't control, right? But um, a large part of it is under our control and not just dictated by our genes. I do have to add the obligatory legal disclaimer. And in particular, I want you to look at the top one, right? If I have motivated you to make big changes to your diet and you are on, say, insulin or other diabetic medications, if you're on blood pressure medication, absolutely talk to your doctor first. Make sure they are following you. Some of these changes can be very powerful and it can be dangerous. You can drop your blood sugar or your blood pressure to dangerous levels. So please talk to your doctor and make sure that they are tracking it, adjusting your medication levels, right? And it's that powerful. There are absolutely reports of people doing that and ending up in the hospital because they didn't adjust their medication levels appropriately. And then my last little word, you can do hard things, right? This is from one of my moms. Every time the kid came in, they were afraid of everything. I look in the ear, you know, and the mom would tell her every time, you can do hard things. And I just love this. I have it on a dry erase board up in my office. You can do hard things. So thank you very much for, you know, hearing me out today, listening. Uh, I really appreciate it. So uh, what do you think? Was it lit? Are you shook? <laughs> Thanks for listening to today's episode. I hope you found it useful and I hope you learned a lot. Like I said, go to your library, go to your bookstore, buy those books. Both authors are amazing. Their work is incredible. 
Dr. Greger has his nonprofit website, nutritionfacts.org, and you can hear more of all the amazing work that he does in looking in depth at the science behind how your nutrition affects so many different aspects of your health. If you found today's episode useful and you really want to hear more, go to the website and subscribe so that you can get email alerts every time I release a new episode. It would also be really helpful if you rate the show and maybe even leave a review. I appreciate it. Thanks for listening and don't forget to eat your greens. Be aware that this podcast provides general health information about nutrition and feeding of infants and children and is meant for educational purposes only. It's not intended to replace the important relationship between a parent, child, and pediatrician. If you have concerns about your child's nutrition, health, or growth, please consult your doctor.